to the exercise of the So we have a lot to pray about for one another. There's a copy in your bulletin. Uh, someone probably handed you one when you came in. So you do have a prayer list in your bulletin. I wanted to share this with you today that in the bulletin, or whether you're on Zoom, we ask for you to share your concerns with us. And it's good that we share our concerns with one another as brothers and sisters of Christ. We pray for health and healing. We pray for our spiritual and emotional work. And we pray for heaven's glory for those who have passed on. Many of the people that are on our prayer list are family from inside this church, are actually related to us, are friends of the family, and so forth. We have people who send emails sometimes or call us and say, Sandra, would you put somebody on this list? Or Tony please add somebody to this list. So, the prayer list for the church is quite well now. And of course, we have plenty to pray about by just looking at the names. If you think of them as just one prayer request, and then think about some people have two prayer requests, maybe three. This is the tense exponential. Are we grows and grass? And we come together as a community of, of grace. But sometimes, as a community or as an individual, we cannot see the forest for the trees. And that sometimes is because of the fire in our own tree house, our own crises or trouble that we may be experiencing in our tree house. I can remember when my son, my first son, who was born in 1974, at age five, was diagnosed with an astrocytoma. Now that's a tumor that grows in finger-like projections. Now we're talking 1979. Back then, there was no chemotherapy, uh, no CAT scans. So he was misdiagnosed. And I had feared that, and I had prayed about that, and I had made sure that we were doing everything that God wanted us to do. And before, during, and after surgery, people came to pray. Strangers came to pray in my home and lay hands on me. My aunt and my uncle set up a teepee so that we could pray for them. We had four meetings to pray for me. After surgery, he did improve. He did start walking again. But he didn't recover right away. Unfortunately, I was told by my other brothers and sisters that it was because I didn't have enough faith. I was told that from not just my church brothers and sisters, but from indigenous brothers and sisters, people who were human gals, who we also went to, as well as medicine. I have a traditional family, and my grandmother was seeking any answer she could find for her little brother, her great grandson. As I mentioned, he did go for radiation therapy. And four months later, unfortunately, he became ill again. While he was ill, I called the hospital and I asked the doctor, you know, he's doing this, he's doing that. And they kept saying, he's fine, he's got a cold, he's getting the flu. On my third phone call, I finally got him sick and pulled the nurse card. And I told him, look, I'm a nurse. And as a registered nurse, I had never, ever seen a child vomit like this. And just began to explain projectile vomiting. And if you've never seen it, you, have you guys ever seen The Exorcist? 
is a great example of projectile art. Okay. Now, the doctor then said, I don't know if it was just to calm me down as a nurse or as mom. Bring him in. We'll look at him. And of course, he was hospitalized for a while. While they couldn't figure out the first few days what was going on with him. But on the third day, he fell asleep. And he stayed asleep. I couldn't wake him up. As much as I touched him, kissed him, grabbed him, he would not wake up. When I realized he'd been asleep way too long, I ran to the nurse's station and found the surgeon who followed me back to the room very quietly. And he sat there at the edge of the bed and also tried to wake him up. He couldn't wake up. He just could not wake up. And he said, Sandra, we'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. So they continued to do tests. They continued to stick him, prod him, everything you can think of. We had plenty of blood tests to do, plenty of bottles to fill up. Well, they finally figured out he had meningitis. And <laughs> doctors being doctors sometimes, or maybe it was just me as a mom being a mom, I heard that one doctor, the surgeon, saying that how did it happen when he was getting radiation therapy? That was what happened. Well, when the radiation therapist showed up, of course, he said, you know, something probably happened up here in surgery, and it just took that little whatever to grow. And it finally caused him to develop full symptoms. So we were basically playing the blame game. And after laying there, I think it was just before Trader's Village, we we're sitting there in the hospital with my son, and my mom says, let's pray. And I looked at her, and I thought, my son is comatose. And I looked at her, and I said, why? Why are we going to pray? I was mad. And I was bitter. And I was no longer mad at doctors. I was mad at God. I said to her, my son is laying here. And I have done everything God has asked me to. And my son is dying. And I knew that because of the type of tumor. And I looked at him and I thought... He was going to be a doctor. That he was going to grow up and give me grandchildren. And that he was who I was going to live with in my old age. Yes, I felt like God had abandoned me. Have you ever felt that way? Of course, Grandma gasped at my response. She couldn't believe the blasphemy coming from my mouth. But mom quietly turned to grandma and all of us and said, I can't blame her. I'm feeling lost too right now. <clears throat> In the scriptures this week, Job gives voice to our pain. And he declares in his bitterness, Oh, that I know where I could find it. Maybe you have never ever experienced the absence of God. But there are those in our congregation, in our church family, who have. Even Mother Teresa, the Blessed Saint of the Church, wrote that most of her life in ministry, she did not hear from God. The words that Job utters, his desire to speak directly to God and plead his case on how unjust he has been treated. Sometimes I know I have felt that way, and maybe sometimes you have felt that way. Those words are a little familiar, are they not? As people of faith, sometimes we find ourselves flailing in the wind, 
unable to hear or experience God's presence. Well, my son never recurred, would recur. He never would, but my faith did. He lived another 10 years. He was semi comatose but he lived another 10 years. My grandparents stayed with me during that entire time to help care for my son because they insisted that I need to work. They tried to give me some normalcy in my life. They wanted to be there with their little brother, their great grandson. Well, after he passed away, they stayed with me for another year later. And then they returned to their homeland. My mom had already returned to her homeland. And for us, as a people, it's a home. And eventually, I found myself alone, or really with no family in my house, and with a four-year-old. Well, where did I get that four-year-old? Well, I got him easily. He was no mess, no fuss, adoption. <laughs> so I had adopted him. And here we were at four, and he was always saying, Mama, who am I going to play with today? And I got to think, you know what the problem is? No family. So I came to church. I came to this church to find family. And I did find family. He was so happy to meet Matthew, he wouldn't believe it. I think Matthew was going to be Santa Claus that year in the Christmas play. So we were very excited. He, I was excited that he was excited to be here. Years later, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the church. Do you remember what year that was to me? What year was that? There's some pictures in the, uh, in the fellowship hall showing that. Yes, there are pictures in the fellowship hall highlighting or showing us celebrating our 40th anniversary. And that's the following morning of our celebration, all the pastors, and what we did is we invited all the pastors from all that ever served here in the Dallas Union United Methodist Church. The past and that Sunday morning, he went to the ministry probably because this <laughs> entire altar was filled with people who were all pastors who had all been here. So we've been asked to give the right hand of fellowship to them. And as we go through the line, we're also introducing ourselves. And as I go through the line, I shake the hands of Paul Sanders. And he recognizes me and he says, How's your mom? And I said, Mom's good. She went back home. And he said, How's her grandson? Tears swelled in my mouth. And he said, We always pray for you. I said, That was my son. And he says, we always pray for you. We always pray that he would recover. And I said, well, he passed away about 10 or 14 years ago. And he hung me another man. And as I thought about the church praying for me, I was woke. I thought, this church prayed for me when I felt like God had abandoned me. My brothers and sisters in Christ were praying for me. And I made it back for that journey of abandonment, back to the house of God. Like Job, I continue to be blessed. Look how big my family is now. I look how old you are, too. <laughs> I have a large family of sisters in grace. And in 20 years, honey, I was 90 years old. <laughs> so, 
I'm fortunate to also have sons, not just the son I adopted, but other sons in the church, in my tribe, who call me auntie, and sometimes they call me mom as well. Uh, so we have plenty to pray about, to be thankful for. <laughs> We come to our church to share our joys and our concerns. So when we get asked, what do we pray about? Remember, you have a list of people who have asked for prayer. Every Sunday night, I'm sorry, every Wednesday night, our pastor takes this list and he reads the names one by one. He doesn't share confidential information like this person's going to have a sex change or this one's going to have an operation. But he actually reads their names out of the lab so that we can pray for them, not just on Sunday morning, but also on Wednesday night. And the lady who originally came up with the idea the prayer list, she's no longer with us. But she used to tell us in our women's meetings, take that list every morning and put it between your hands and say, Lord, bless my brothers and sisters. Be with them today. She got it. You don't have to call out their name. You can just hold their names in your hand, in your heart, and in the prayers. We have plenty to pray about as Native Americans, I was thinking. We have many brothers and sisters who are battling on the front lines to keep our water sacred. Daily we fight to keep our relatives from becoming murdered and missing. Cultural genocide continues to be a problem. We fight every day as indigenous people, not just in North America, but in South America also. In North America, we are in the United States, we are fighting a legal battle to keep children from being removed by the state and placed with non-family members. Children, we recently discovered, were, are, we always knew, were forcibly removed by the state and placed in boarding schools. They were taken from their mothers and fathers, sometimes literally torn from them, and placed in a boarding school. And recently we discovered that many of them didn't survive boarding schools, if they survived the trip. Many, many mass graves and unmarked graves have been found at these boarding schools. I think the last number I looked at is over 1,500. And as a people, we've been asked to come together to pray for our children, for our littlest children who never achieved adulthood. Other problems we see in this country are the digital divide. The United Methodist Women, except for the first time, the digital divide occurred because of COVID, as many things have occurred because of COVID. We're not able to go to church every Sunday, and for a while, we were only seen virtually. But not everyone has access to the internet so that they can see what's going on. Not everyone knows what's happening. I shared that people didn't know that we lost certain brothers and sisters from this church, that people in the Southeast region didn't know. And part of that has to do with the fact that, right, we put it on Facebook, we share it word of mouth, we put it on the internet sometimes, but they don't have access to that. So they won't know that until they see one of us at a meeting where in fellowship we can ask, how is Ruth? How is so and so? So be making that one-on-one -on -one contact is very important. Because of COVID, we may be asking, God, where are you? But it's okay to feel that way. He's a very big God. 
Plus, this is the reality of our human condition. So someone in the pew today, someone online today, I didn't check to see if anyone was online, may also be asking these same questions. Where are you going to? But we're not here as a people to condemn or point fingers at them. We're here as a people to pray for them. We are here to stand in solidarity with one another in prayer. We are here to offer them a cool drink Amen. through prayer. Sharing our prayers, our joys, and concerns as a church is a sign of hope is a sign that of faith that things happen even in darkness. We are a very diverse church. We're not just red, yellow, black, and white, but we're made up of different tribes. If you go back far enough, even if you don't think you're from a tribe or you don't practice with a tribe, you'll discover that yes, you ran in a bridge cloth on the tundra <laughs> at one time. You just have to go back for it. So let us be grateful for the blessings that come from living alongside people of other traditions. It is our responsibility to come together and offer our prayers for all the diverse expressions of our Christian faith. We are reminded by our brothers and sisters in Scotland that a pattern has been set for us. It has been lived out in Jesus Christ and has been made possible by the Holy Spirit. May we follow in his way and be guided by the second commandment that Jesus gave us to love one another. Paul shared in his letter in Hebrews, Jesus, the Son of God, as the one who acts on our behalf and who will bring us into his gracious presence of God. Our time of need is now, and the world's needs are plenty. In such a time as this, we turn to the great high priest who has faced and endured all that we have faced and endured. We do so knowing that the one who is endured all will enable us to approach the throne of Christ with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace in that time of need. <clears throat> so as we come to the end, I'm going to close in prayer. I'm not a pastor. But I am a sister of grace. I'm going to pray today at the altar. Why don't you join me? Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for all our nations. Let's bless the beast. Yeah. You can bring prayer with When the music is over, the prayer will be over. You can pray silently to yourself. Yeah.